you see me all the time. Um, we have uh, two more yeah, we, have. we have the deputy borough president, Ed Burke, and yeah, Ed graduated from Wacker in 1980. So proud alum. Great institution. Yeah. The co-editor of the Wagner? No, the editor. The editor. Yeah. 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 So there you go. Yeah. So you're in good shape. I was going to say he was also the founder, but it was founded in 1896. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I am running to Fort Richmond to do an interview with Mayor Swan on our program at Fort Richmond, you know, the partnership we have. So I'm running there, so I'm not going to be able to stay for this. But I know that Dave Martin is on the way over and Mara Garcia are on the way over. So and your provost. And Lily McCann, provost here is coming. So you'll get joined by some people. We have the distinguished <coughs> Professor A. Bunker, distinguished Roy Weintraub here, Jason Fitzgerald over in the corner. You got a whole, you got a special thing going here today. So you've got a lot of, a lot of firepower in the room. Good, enjoy this immensely. I'll let you be. Jim, you going to do pension reform? Is that what you're going to do? You're going to do pension reform? Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah. And carry and stay. And you can keep that dark, you can get that dark in. Because you're going to show, uh, you're going to have a lot of visual stuff today. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you thank so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Whenever you want. Whatever. You know, you know how I'd like to start if we could? Can we just go from student to student, tell us where you're from and um, what your major is? Just so we get a little lay of the land tip. Because when I went to WAC, almost everybody was from the tri state area. New Jersey, Connecticut, New York. Now it's the opposite, so we just want to get the lay of the land. So why don't we start with you? My name's uh, Michael Beck. I'm from the <coughs> Islands, and I'm a chemistry major. Um, Courtney Begley, political science and English double major, and I'm from the Islands. Okay. Michael Joe, I'm from Ohio, and I'm from Fayetteville. Okay. Starting down there. Uh, I'm, I'm Jamie. I'm from New Jersey, and I'm <coughs> saying. My name is Pat Molinario from Staten Island, and my major is design technology. <coughs> and it's Molinari, not Molinaro. Right, and not, <laughs> and not related to Guy. You have to say that a lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm Megan, I'm from Long Island, and I'm a biopsychology major. Okay. Um, I'm Kristen, I'm from Reno, Nevada, and I'm undecided. I think I'm an international affairs major. <laughs> I'm Robin Levy, I'm from Boston, and I'm an arts administration major. I'm Patricia Ann McCaffrey, I'm from Long Island, and I'm an education major. I'm Megan from Long Island, and I'm a sociology That's the second best way to get to Staten Island, right? Long Island? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then finally over there. Uh, I'm Joe Sanaris, I'm from Long Island, and I'm a history major. And he's an outstanding football player. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Dominic, I'm from Brooklyn, I'm a lot of political science majors. My name is Jason Keel. Uh, I'm from Mississippi. I'm a political science major. Great. Well, actually, we have a lot of tri-state area folks in this class. But, uh, that's good. Our provost has just walked in, and maybe we're going to stop the program now. The president just said a few words. Lily, would you want to uh, say a few words also? Then we'll introduce the... Uh, uh, Mr. Yes, speaker, it's such an honor and a pleasure to welcome you here, and I'm so pleased that we have this opportunity to hear from you about your experiences and provide such an inspiration for our students. And that's one of the things that we're really proud of and pleased with our honorable no, no, Dr. Blackman. <laughs> <laughs> and so, welcome to all of you, and a special greeting to you. Thank you. Uh, Provost McNair came here from Spelman College. This is what, her first semester. She yes. arrived in the summer and she's doing outstanding work. She Thank succeeded you. Provost and Laura Lieberman, who became president of Laverne College in California. Now, I have the great pleasure of um, introducing an uh, outstanding individual. And uh, the topic that was selected is the effectiveness of an elected official. And I can tell you that this individual who I'm going to introduce has been one of the most effective borough presidents in the last decade. And I think you were elected 10 years ago? 2001. 2001. And has done an outstanding job and will continue uh, until term limits uh, goes into effect in a couple of years. And maybe there'll be changes there also, because we can have them uh, <laughs> uh, afterwards as well. And he's here today with um, his uh, 
Deputy Borough President Ed Kurt, and uh, I just want to let you know that a good friend of yours wanted to come in from um, from West Orange, New Jersey, Helene Burke, but she what, had to be in Minnesota. Right. I think a great granddaughter is being born or something oh, like great. that. Okay. So she sends the best regards to you and thank to you, Ed. Thank well. you very much. And um, anyway, uh, this is a very special treat for us. Uh, I've known Jimmy Molinaro, the borough president, for the last 10 years. He has done what very few borough presidents have done, and that is make a difference as an effective leader in the borough of Staten Island. And in many ways, I mean, uh, he has said frequently that uh, children comprise 25% of the population, but in many ways, they are 100% in terms of our efforts to improve education and the island and the city of New York. He's also been very effective in greening the island, making sure that Staten Island remains as the greenest borough. And uh, when I was elected to the uh, state senate a few years before he became borough president, uh, I was very concerned and upset by the excessive development taking place on the island. And as many of you know, I represented the north shore of Staten Island as well as different parts of Brooklyn that Senator Savino, who succeeded me, uh, now represents. Uh, this man has done a tremendous amount in terms of eliminating excessive <coughs> development in the island. I think it's by one third and uh, of the island, and he'll probably go into that as well. Uh, here's a man who has lived on the island for over half a century. I was only introduced to the island when I was elected to the state senate 16 years ago. He was born on the Lower East Side to Italian-American immigrant parents, and uh, when he was 27 years old and married, he moved to Staten Island, and he was a businessman, he had a successful recycling business, and at the same time was very, very much involved politically. He was the deputy borough president to, um, uh, to uh, Guy, Molinari. Guy Molinari, I wanted to say to uh, uh, Patrick uh, Molinari, but to Guy Molinari, and uh, he did an outstanding job in that arena, but as I say to you, today, he, in my opinion, is one of the most effective borough presidents that we've had in the city of New York. And one more thing I want to add, and that is I really got to know him after redistricting occurred in 2001. Uh, now we're, we're discussing in our classes the, the uh, problems with redistricting uh, taking place in 2011 with the legislature wanting one thing and the governor saying he will be there with, and the courts perhaps getting into the act if the governor and the legislature cannot uh, do anything about it. One of the most important things to happen to me is I had been a state senator for almost a decade from the borough of Brooklyn. I then ran for a seat that was 50% Staten Island and North Shore and 50% Brooklyn. And there was one man who I couldn't have won without his support. I couldn't have won Staten Island. It's true I won Brooklyn by 80%, but I also won Staten Island by 55%. And I was the only state senator who had, at, when I was in the state senate, the support of the Democratic Party, the Working Families Party, and the Conservative Party. And this gentleman still is the Conservative Party leader uh, on the island. And one thing that I know, that he helped me immensely. And another thing I know, he is one of the most loyal and honest politicians in the city and the state of New York that we can ever meet. And I will always appreciate that, Jimmy, for what you've done. Thank you. And for what you continue to do. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the outstanding borough president of Staten Island, 
who will speak on the topic of the effectiveness of an elected official. He, in my opinion, is one of the most effective elected officials in the city and states of New York. Take him. Stay on even longer. Good morning and thank you. Thank you very much. Let me give you first a little color of my background. I was born in the Lower East Side, like uh, Senator Lacton like said. I was one of six children. Five of us survived, one passed on. And we lived in a cold water flat on the fifth floor. Very interesting, beautiful place to live. Great, great childhood. No complaints at all. Dad, all he did was work six days a week. Uh, I went to work when I was 12, shiny shoes, on the corner of Bloom and Broadway, which today has a big Bloomingdale store. <laughs> Those days, there's no Bloomingdale stores there. <coughs> in fact, the rent was about six to seven dollars a month, as I recall, for four railroad rooms. Stayed there, got out of high school, decided not to go to college, because I wanted to go out and make some money. My family was opposed to it. I was the youngest of six. I was a accident. I was not playing out of the six. <laughs> The age difference between myself and my siblings was large, so I just came along and they kept me, I guess. <laughs> and uh, so I had every opportunity to go, go to higher education. I didn't want to go, I went out to work. I got in business, I was in business for 24, 24 years. It was recycling. At that time it was called junk business. Today it's called recycling, a lot of fancy names. Got married, moved out to uh, Brooklyn for a little short period of time. They moved to Staten Island. Always wanted to be involved. I always felt that, uh, and my wife was a strong supporter of it, that you, if you, you can't complain unless you want to get involved. And I got involved in, in politics in a very, very equal way, distributing literature and stuff, so forth and so on, which you normally do. And before you know, it sucks you in. It sucks you in. And uh, went to a district leader, a club leader, then a district leader, got involved with politics. <coughs> my first political job was working as an administrative assistant in Washington for Congressman Guy Molinari, who was the congressman at the time. I knew him as an assembly person, and uh, when he went to work for Congress, he asked me to be his administrative assistant for two years. Then I went on to be his chief of staff, so I spent nine years in Washington. Then he became the borough president, I became his deputy borough president. I know I'm going a little fast, but I just wanted to get to where it becomes more interesting. And then I was deputy borough president for 12 years. I, when he became borough president, he had to be his deputy. I was deputy borough president for 12 years. So when you're serving at the city government, you're serving in Washington, and you're involved with the Albany politics, and we were very, very involved in Albany politics, I say, I soon became an officer of the conservative party in New York State. And New York State is different than any other state in America, because it's the only state where you can accumulate your vote on more than one line. Does everybody know that? Is that a Something new? Well, you knew that, right? It might be on their final exam. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now you know. You could, in New York State, you could run on two lines or three lines or four lines. You could accumulate your vote for a total vote. You can't do that in any other state in America. You have to win on one line, whatever line that could be. So that's why the conservative party line and the liberal party line, you don't, they don't exist in other states because you're just wasting the vote. You can't get the support that you would get. And the conservative party, was accommodated because the Liberal Party had created in our Constitution in New York State to create a third line where you could accumulate the vote. So I, I very rapidly rose in the Conservative Party. I uh, remember enrolling and uh, signing up to vote when I was 21 years of age. At that time, you weren't allowed to vote at 18, you had to be 21. And I voted blank because we had a Democratic Party and a Republican Party. And in my opinion, they were both going the same direction. I said, neither one offers anything that I that I support. So I, I, I just registered black, no, no no political affiliation at all. When the Conservative Party started in 1960, I was very interested in it, reading about it in the old uh, Journal American. I went to some meetings, I put an interest. So I rapidly rose in that, and then in 1980, 1981, I became the state executive vice chairman of the party. So I had a lot of influence about endorsements, who got the endorsements, who didn't get the endorsements throughout the state. So that was my political history, not my political history. 
But you learn something, you learn something when you're going through these different positions. You learn government at all different levels, and you find out the governments are all the same. It's all the same. Government is not what it seems to be. It is what, what you want it to be. And it is to an extent, it can be what you want it to be. But there's always sacrifices you have to make in between. From 1974, New York City went broke. We won bankruptcy. Now, you may read in some books, and some literature that didn't go broke. Went broke. Why do I say went broke? Because, in my opinion, if you owe me five dollars, and it's due to come, that five dollars is due on Tuesday morning, and Tuesday morning you come to me and say, "Well, I'm going to postpone paying for ten years," legislatively, you're broke. You can call any fancy word you. We were broke. We were broke. We had a governor that had just become governor, Governor Carey, who was, I admired 110 percent. I'm very friendly with the family, still friendly with the family. <clears throat> and he bailed out New York City. And he bailed out New York City by creating the Finance Board, the Emergency Finance Board, and he also bailed out New York City by taking away some rights from New York City, which I'm going to explain to you and show you on the video. Now, those rights had taken away from us at that time was the right thing to do, but actually it hurt us in the future, going out into the future. Now, one other thing, that you might have seen that ad that Ford said drop dead to New York, you might have heard about that, so that's un absolutely untrue, 110 percent untrue. He never said that, and if Ford wasn't president, New York would have not been bailed, bailed out by the federal government. Was the federal government at the time owned houses for Democrat, and the Democrat that controlled the banking committee did not want to bail out New York City. And they said, "Why should we bail them out?" Said the Department of Sanitation worker is making more money than the doctor is in Nebraska. Why should I bail them out? That's why they broke. And it was Ford who appealed to the Republican colleagues to give us the necessary vote. So that's how we got that. So it's untrue. That part is untrue. I, I thought it should be made. So I want to show you what the problem is with government today. And I just tell you about interacting with government. We're no different than we were 1974, but we are different. New York is broke, but also is broke. Aubrey, they're broke. And the federal government's broke. We're all broke. All of us are broke. And you may know this. But November 7th is a very important day. Because November 7th, for the first time in the history of America, the United States will owe more money in debt, 15 and one quarter trillion dollars, than we have produced in gross national product last year. And there's only two other countries in the world that have that honor. That's Italy and Spain. No other country. So if we hold more money out than we produce it each year. It's the first time that's happened to us. So we're in bad shape. If anybody thinks differently, he was just mistaken. And it just didn't happen. Well, I will show you, and not some numbers that I put together. These are numbers that exist. You might not like them, but you can't argue with me. These are not my numbers. You know? And I've given this presentation, I've always said that. You can dislike the numbers, but you can't dislike me because these are not my numbers. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fact of life, and you have to face it. You have to face it. And we have to do something about it, seriously. Now, Senator Lagman made a very good point. He said that I, I, I normally say to people that 25% of our population are children, and they were 100% of our future. Yes, but you are our future. You are our future. As I look out there, I'm looking at young men and young women. They're going to be our doctors, our lawyers, our physicists, our astronauts, whatever. You're going to lead this country. And when you go out there to lead this country, this is what you're going to be looking at. Maybe not directly, but that's what's going to affect you. And you're going to bring that to change. There's got to be changes made. There's got to be changes made. Fair changes. So let's get into that. Let me, and while we're going through the, through the presentation, you can ask a question. Don't wait till the end, because you may forget or you may not be understanding the point that's being made in between. So let's go through the presentation. 
drop the lights a little bit. Hey, I don't know, they got a lot of sunlight coming. Yeah. That's 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 my bad. Okay, maybe I'll say it again. Okay. okay, one of the things we need in New York City, New York State is pension reform. We need it desperately. You say, well, why do we need pension reform? We seem to be doing pretty well with it. Well, this is the reason why we need pension reform. New York City has a budget of $63 billion. That budget for New York City is greater than 25 states in America. There's 25 states in America that don't have a budget for the whole state of $63 billion. In fact, Jersey has a budget of only $37 billion. This is our budget for New York City. So looking at that number, you say, well, why is the mayor always complaining? It's just $63 billion. This budget is greater than 25 states. Why is he complaining he can't fill potholes? Why is he complaining what's a cut of firehouse? It's a very good question. Let me show you why. Because the budget is made up of $21 billion of mandated expenses that the mayor cannot touch. It doesn't belong to him. All he does do is put into it, but he can't. What is the mandated touch? Medicaid money that comes from the, state, from the federal government. He can't touch that, but he has to contribute to it. The pensions that he has to contribute to it in there. He can't touch that. That's off the table. There's an additional $22 billion that the Board of Education uses. But just think of that figure. The Board of Education of the City of New York, it's $22 billion in their budget. Okay? And they educate 1 billion kids. 1, one million kids. So it's 22,000 per kid they educate. The mayor's left with this little pie here. This is the money that the mayor has left out of this big $63 billion budget. He has $20 billion. That's for running the fire department, running the police department, running the sanitation department, fixing the streets, fixing this, fixing that, doing this, whatever you want to think of, and paying the salaries of 265,000 employees. That's all but about $20 billion. That's all he has. Not the 63 billion, that's a number. But it's not his number. Okay, next. In 2001, when I was elected, Federal president and the mayor was elected, uh, Bloomberg was elected mayor for the first time. The budget for the city was $41 billion. In 2011, $63 billion. Now, when you look at that, there's an increase of about $22 billion increase in the budget. That's my correct? Okay. But yet, but yet, if you look at the portion in the pie, you would find that the mayor's only increased by five billion. He had sixteen billion. He had fifteen billion dollars. He had fifteen billion dollars of his own money in two thousand and one. Now he has twenty billion. So his part only went up five billion dollars, but the budget went up twenty-two billion. All right, just keep that in mind. Now look, there's a problem. <clears throat> I'm going to show you what's happening in two thousand and one to the present time, 2012. In the year 2000, the employee contribution to their pension was just about $1 billion. And the contribution by the city of New York was a little less than a $1 billion. Now fast forward to the present budget, which is the 2012 budget, which was adopted in July, New York City contributes $8.3 billion into the pension system of New York City. And the employees contribute just a little over $1 billion. Okay, so now the mayor in 2000 was contributing less than a $1 billion. <coughs> but he had a $15 billion budget of his own. And the same budget of his own now, he has to contribute $8 billion. So that's an increase of seven billion. So any increase that he got from the fifteen to twenty went to the pension. Plus, there's a sub, there's, there's a deficit, another three billion dollars for fire, so forth and so on and so forth and so on. So that's the problem that we see going forward. So how do we get to that problem? Well, obviously we know that pensions skyrocket. There was changes in NICES. Tier 4, obviously increase in life expectancy, overtime abuse, disability fraud, and stock market decline. 
Let me just stay there for a minute. Yeah. I was going to ask, would that include the Long Island Railroad there? Yeah. No, no, no. No, no. no, no, no. Okay, that's their own problem. Oh, that's a separate that's their own problem. <laughs> let, let me just explain to you what, to show you the sincerity of it, the, 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 the seriousness of it. When Carey became governor, we had a program in, in Albany that was Tier 1. That was called, Tier 1 was, was the retirement plan. That plan said that you paid absolutely nothing into your pension, zero you paid. You paid zero into your medical, and you retired with 90% of your salary. Whatever the rate 90% of your salary was at the time you retired, <coughs> that was called Tier 1. One of the things that Kerry did, he eliminated it. He said, we can't afford it. He said, we just cannot afford Tier 1. So they're operating now, right now at Tier 5. That shows you that there's been four different changes made. And we're still at this position. If Tier 1 was still in existence, it would have been four years ago. Right? right. <laughs> it right. would right. Right. have been four years ago. You can't afford it. Can you imagine why you Working and finishing your salary at seventy thousand and get ninety percent or sixty-three thousand dollar pension, and not paying into your medical at all, not a penny, and not paying a penny into that pension before you got it. So there are the changes. So we got tier four. That's how abusive it was, how stupid it was, that these grown men up there would vote for something like that. All right. So that's <clears throat> that's part of the problem. What's happening is that the changes to tier four. Now, remember, this is tier four. We started with tier one. When Kerry was there. <clears throat> now, Tier 4 in 1993, the way it existed in 1993, you could retire at age 62, you were vested after 10 years, and 3% of your salary was the contribution that you made into the pension system during the course of your employment. If you were 10 years, 20 years, you paid 3% of your salary, whether it was you were making 50000 or 10000 Okay. Now, this is what happened. 1999. 1999, <clears throat> somebody felt very, very good about themselves. So now, the other thing that that Kerry did, he removed the bargaining rights away from the city of New York with the unions, and he made it for the state. He said the state will negotiate with the unions because you people down in New York City just give money away. And they took away the bargaining rights that the state had. Now that was good at that time, and it was important, but it's no longer good now, because what you have now, you have a, a senator or an assemblyman from Buffalo who's deciding what the pension system should be for somebody in New York City, and what they should be paying to somebody in New York City that's being pushed and pulled by some union leader up in Buffalo. He doesn't care. It's not coming out of his pocket. It's coming out of the pocket of New York City. So that's what's bad about it. So in 1999, he said, you know, it's time now, everything is good, let's change the laws. And they changed it. They changed the retirement from 62 to 57. <coughs> and he said, why wait for 10 years before you're vested in the system? We're going to vest you up to five years. And then they said, well, instead of paying 3% of your salary, you'll pay 485 for the first 10 years, then you go down to 185 for the rest of the, rest of the time. Yes. What does vested mean? Vested means that you're entitled to a pension. Otherwise, you, it, it, you have to work for five years in a company, then you're entitled to the pension. If you leave before five years, you can't. So if you look at that number, that number and what it means is absolutely staggering. Now, I'm going to give you an incident. I'm out to dinner one night with uh, Mayor Bloomberg, and Mayor Bloomberg has a, has a plan to introduce the pension reform along with Governor Cuomo. And I bring up the point about the five years. <clears throat> and he says to me, Jimmy, how many people could there be? I says, we've checked it. And there's tens of thousands of people that have worked for the city for five years, five and a half years, six years, seven years, eight years, nine years, <coughs> that would not be vested under the old plan. Under the new plan, they're all vested. But when, it comes, when they become 57 years old, they're going to knock on your door and they're going to say, where's my check? So if someone went to work for the city of New York, let's say when he was 45, he worked for five years and he left. He's now 50. He's collected already. He's, of course, he's 57. This happened 12 years ago. He's collected. We can't afford it. 
And this is the hidden, another hidden value. And again, I repeat, these are not my numbers. <laughs> I didn't draw these numbers up there. These are the actual numbers. These are the facts of life. Okay, so that was the problem. Then the 3%, the 3% after 10 years, and some, and, and some jobs in the city of New York after 10 years, you don't pay at all to their pension system. That's why you saw on the first chart that the contribution for the employee stayed about the same over 10 years, but the contribution from the employer, which is the city of New York, went all the way up 8.1 billion because he was paying both heads. Next. Okay, so in some cases, we're paying four people for the same job. It's not what we think, what's going on. Let me show you. Tom gets a job at the age of 22. So he retires, this is uniform, uniform workers. <coughs> sanitation department, sanitation, fire, and police. When he's 42 years of age, he retires. That's 20 years later. Now Bob takes, it, takes his job over. So he retires. 20 years later, he's 62 now, and Joy is taking care of taking his job, his job, his job. And four years later, you got four people selecting the same salary. He's, they're selected by pension. He's selected by working. That's the way the system works. Now, <clears throat> and the abuse, and you have abuse of people that from pensions. There's one article from last year, June 19. City worker earning 210,000 solid salary. He ties a pension of $242,000. And I firmly believe no one that works for government is entitled to $242,000 pension, including the President of the United States, who only gets $191,000. But I guess he's not putting enough overtime. That's <laughs> <laughs> his problem. So these are the abuses that go on, and there's hundreds of them. You probably saw recently that. Uh, was it 35 percent? All five of the poverty go down in disability. The disability is three quarters pay, tax free, which is more salary than you were making before you went on a disability. And the other point also that should be made is that when you retire with a New York City pension, a New York State pension, you don't pay city or state tax anymore. You stop. You stop paying city and state tax. So you're not even giving back to your community. Then if you move out to Florida, <coughs> You're not even spending in your community, so the community is losing everything. So we have three people off the payroll, collecting pensions, not paying no tax against that pension, and then also they're spending their money somewhere else. That's what brings up the, poor, the part that the state has to, the city, the state has to put in. There's a certain level. It's seven and a half percent. It's got to be seven and a half percent deposit into the pension system by the city of New York, or by the money you earn with the pension system, one or the other, or what you get from the employees. But they have, you need that figure. If you don't have that figure, you're losing money. And then the city has to make up for it. The city has to deposit money into it. Now, how does that affect you as a citizen? In 2001, every citizen, taxpaying citizen of New York City, $682 of their tax, the city took and used it for pension systems. This was the $1 billion that they paid. This year, 2012, $3,773 of your tax money, whether it's tax on a bottle of soda, whether it's tax on your real estate tax, whether it's tax on a pair of shoes or a dress, the government of the of city of New York takes that money and pays the pen, throws it to the pension system. So that's how it affects you. Now, this is just an obvious slide. Now, the, the city has less money, obviously, to strengthen our firehouses and improve our parks, keep our streets clean, repair potholes and improve roads and so forth and so on. That's how it breaks down. The city has less and less money. But the first obligation, and under the, the financial commission that was started by Kerry, we have to balance each and every year. Our budget has to be balanced. If it's not balanced, then the state comes in and takes over our budget. All right? Right. And runs it. So that's, you have to balance the budget. And the money has to come from somewhere. 
So what do they do? They put uh, they put red, red red lights up in the corner. If you go through the red light camera, you know nothing that helps anybody. That's getting the red light. And just so you know, last year they collected fifty-seven million dollars. Fifty-seven million dollars. So those those cameras are put there for one reason: to raise revenue. They're not put there to protect people from getting hit by a car. And that's the way it goes. Now they have an idea of an Albany that they're going to put it for speedy, and that would be a tragedy. That would be a tragedy. At thirty-five miles an hour, you get a fifty-dollar ticket. Well, you go on Highland Boulevard with your car and look at the speed out of it. You do 35 miles an hour, everybody's skipping you. <laughs> That's not, not a ploy for, for additional taxes. And, and I, I tell you, I, you should write all means, tell, tell the legislature people out of your mind. Out of your mind, best now. It's only, it, it's only to generate revenue. That's all it's for. It's not to improve the quality of life. Right. You're taking all these issues into account. My proposal for reforming the pension system. And again, right, thanks. And again, I want to say very, very clearly, you're not breaking any contract with anyone. Anyone that's working now or lost the work before, the, the, new, the new laws are passed. The new rules are passed. You're entitled to what you have. Not a penny is taken away from you. It's no different, it's no different than the people who are tier one and the next people came to work in 76 with tier two, tier three, and tier four. The tier one still have their they won't guarantee So we're not taking anything away from anybody. We're just saying, these are the new rules. And the new rules is, the retirement age should go back to 62 and 57. <coughs> there should be a greater employee contribution. There should be a contribution of 3.4 for the whole length of your employment. You should be vested after 10 years, not 5 years. And over time, can count towards pension. And a greater contribution to the health care. The health care, so you take the health care for the teachers, you take the health care for uh, the firemen, the policemen. They don't pay a single nickel into it once they retire. The city of New York picks that up. And last year the, the bill was one and a half billion dollars, over the eight and a half million billion dollars, which we had put up there. And we turned the power of negotiations to the, back to the city to agree. We must honor the commitment to the current retirees and employees and going forward to make changes for new government employees as we did in 74, 75, 76, and 77. Let me show you another gimmick. This is the state budget. And if you notice it from 95 to 2011, the state budget has gone up from 63 billion, which is the city budget now, $136 If you pull out some news clippings, you'll see every governor will tell you, I cut the budget. I cut the budget this year. I cut the budget. Everybody cut the budget. But you know, if you look at this, nobody cut the budget. You know why? The budget wasn't cut. But they cut was the proposed budget. Well, that goes how it operates. You go to all the agencies. You say, what's your proposed budget for next year? They only have 15%. So the budget there from 63 billion is 92 billion. So the governor comes back and he cuts it down to 80. I cut the budget. I cut the budget. You didn't cut the budget. You cut the proposed budget. The budget has finally been cut. It was cut last year by Governor Cuomo. Next. This, this you'll get a kick out of this. You say, well, how, how did they run the state? You know, they, they weren't closing these budgets. They, they had all kinds of gimmicks. One gimmick, the Cross Westchester Expressway. Some of you people have ever ridden on there? Did anybody drive on there? Well, you should know. We don't own that no more. They sold that. The state sold it. Sold it. They said, let's sell it. They sold bonds. So they swear X amount of billion dollars. They went to Wall Street. Wall Street says, we'll buy it. And we'll rent it back to the state. They get interest each year. No? They did the same thing with Attica Prison. He says, why should we own a prison? They get rid of the prison. We don't own the prison. It's owned by stockholders. And we pay them rent. So these were the gimmicks that the state was using all these years to balance the budget. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story. This young, very energetic assemblyman goes up to Albany and they're discussing the budget of conference. 
and uh, you know, they find ways to close the budget. And he raises his hand, he says, Mr. Speaker, he says, you know, he says, listening to the conversation, he says, there's a bridge in my town. Maybe we can sell that. So the old, the old man next to him in the show says, son, we sold that five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but that gives you an idea that gave me some this is what was going on this day. So Governor Cuomo ran for governor and he said, I'm going to reform the state. Now, it's hard that someone who was involved in Serbia, involved in Serbia all my life, would come out publicly and endorse him. But I read a lot of the stuff that he wrote, and I believed that he would do what he had to do. And I was right. As a man, he balanced the budget. How did he balance the budget? He came in, they had a budget of $136 billion. This year's budget is $132 billion. That is cut in the budget. That's cut in the budget. You know? It's like you're spending $100 a week at home, then spending $80. That's cut in the budget. Cut the budget is done if you go home and your spouse says to you, I saved you $10,000 today. Well, how did you save me $10,000? She said, well, I bought you a Ford instead of a Cadillac. <laughs> I, I can't even afford the Cadillac. The Ford, what are you telling me? He, these are gimmicks. But he's, he, he's done it. He has done it. This is the proof of it. Now, I'm a strong supporter of Governor Cuomo's reforms in every area. In labor, in, in pension reforms, and uh, Here's a lot, lot stronger than what I'm proposing, but next. Now, the governor says that if we do pension reform, we would save $90 billion in 30 years without affecting anyone that has a pension. It's in the system now that has a pension that has a certain figure attached to it, a certain right. And my, you know, my question is very simple. If you don't want to contribute to your pension, don't go to work for the state. You're not forced, you're not drafted to go to work for the state or the city. No one, no one drafts you and say you have to go to work for the city of New York. Don't go to work. Get a job somewhere else. But you have to work by the rules where you're just not destroying everyone else around you. And that's it. Okay. My presentation, and that's the problem that we we are facing. Yes, yes, whatever. Any question at all on that or any other matter on government? I have a matter of uh, it's a different matter though. Yes. Um, what's your stance on what to do with the Fresh Kills landfill? Uh, do you think that we should be putting uh, some sort of windmills up there or something like that that are able to do in other cities? You can see from this question, he doesn't come from New Hampshire, he comes from Staten Island. He comes from Staten Island, <laughs> then, then you should be familiar. We were responsible for closing it, the landfill, and we, we were able to close it for one reason. Because Mars was here, Jupiter was here, oh, everything was in the right place. I'm, I'm not kidding you, everything was in the right place. We had the opportunity to do it. We had Governor Pataki that was willing to sign, sign the bill to do it. We had Giuliani that owned the Staten Island because we elected the mayor of the city of New York. And we had a, a borough president and a deputy was with me there who was really, you know, wanted to close. So everything was in the right place. Uh, the city didn't want to close it before for a number of reasons. There's almost a billion dollars a year that we pay to export our garbage right now. Billion dollars a year. Out of, out of that, Twenty billion dollars, that's what the mayor spends one billion dollars, just to export the garbage each year. So they didn't want to close it. So everything was in place to close it. So when that took place, right after that I became the borough president. Uh, that happened in July and I became borough president in, uh, in the following January. I went to Governor Pataki and I told Governor Pataki, I said, I'd like to have a half a million dollars. I want to do a test on the windmill, to, I'm sorry, on the landfill to see if windmills are practically put there economically. He gave it half a million dollars. He called the Port Authority, however they worked out, so he gave us half a million dollars. We went out to a consulting company, they did a study. They did a 14-month all-season study, which really takes 12 months, but we did it for 14 months. And it came back very, very, very strong. He said, that's the only place in New, York, in New York City where it would be reasonable and economic to do it. 
and seven windmills would generate at that time, the type of windmills we had in place, almost 18 megawatts of electricity a year. Now what's 18 megawatts? 18 megawatts is about 3% of what we use in Staten Island every day. That was fine. He said, easy to do. And the study was put out and uh, nobody debated the study. They, they argued it, but nobody debated it. That would be for seven. So I'm in favor of that. I'm in favor of windmills out there. I think we should put the same seven windmills would generate today 32 megawatts. Why the increase? The increase is because of the more modern windmills that generate more electricity. So it would be great. It would be great. What would we do? We do a number of things. We have a paper plant right next to it. BC paper. These, these recycled paper. Track paper. They use 23 megawatts of electricity a year. It would be ideal for them instead of buying it from upstate in the watershed. So we're we're on board there, and when we understand, in fact, we met last week with the city deputy mayor that the request for proposals is going out by the city asking people, do you, do you want to put windmills here? Give us a proposal for it. And it's, it's a no-brainer, because it's a no-brainer, because number one, it's no cost to the city at all. No cost. If you were putting the windmills, you would pay for them. The land that you put it on, you would rent from me as the city. It doesn't cost me anything. It's 100%. But the Parks Department <coughs> has a little temptation about us, but uh, they, they're on board now. They're on board. So that uh, we're looking forward to get that done. Maybe not by the next two years, but maybe the next two or three years. Well, the President's answer underscores something. The government is paralyzed now. Everything takes so long. The windmills are so common sense, you would think they would be done like that. But now we're 10 years and talking about it. It takes nine years to move a hydrant. You know, we're just paralyzed. Nothing can happen quickly. So I think that's part of the problem. And um, so that's why I think New Jersey likes to have so many small towns, because it's a small group of people who could just say, I want to move the hydrant, and nobody can tell them otherwise. Here you got to go through environmental reviews and every imaginable bureaucracy. One interesting thing, Jim, is you can tell the common sense guy. So here we have the cleanest drinking water in the country in New York. We get it from the reservoirs. The most pure, good-tasting water you'll ever find. But we're spending thousands of dollars on bottled water. So tell them what you did. Um, uh, what did you refer to? The bottle of water that you, you cut that, you just said, why are we giving yeah. our employees bottled water? Well, that, that was our office. We had the, uh, <coughs> I'm in the office there now, 12 and 10, 21, 20, 20 years between Deputy Borough President and, and, and Borough President. I have never laid anyone off. And I can tell you that I went to work there in 89 with Guy Bolinari, we had 142 employees. We now have 43 or 44, I'll give or take. We have 43 or 44. I'm never employed. And I hate to lay people off, which is terrible. It is absolutely terrible. So that, two years ago, when the <coughs> mayor came down with 3% cut, an additional 5% cut right after that, I was short money. There was no, there was no question. I was short money, no matter what I did there. So I, uh, I called my staff in and I told my staff, I says, uh, what do we use on water cool money? Uh, they gave me a figure. It was something like $4,300 a year. I said, okay, when the contract is up, we have to get no more water cool water from the Poland. Then I said, uh, all the Xerox machines we have in the office, I want to, I want to count for each machine and how many feet it is from somebody that's walking to it. I get rid of a lot of fax machines. I, I saved almost $38,000 a year on fax machines. I saved the salary. Mm. Right? I'm the only borough president that doesn't have a chauffeur. I don't have a driver. For, for the gentleman that drives for me works in the office. <coughs> like today he's driving me here, he's parking, he goes back, but he works in the office. I don't have a driver. And I, never, I never had a driver since I was borough president. And uh, I use that $48,000 a year. I have the only senior center open on a Saturday in the city of New York, in New York, and I pay for that with, the, with his salary, with the salary of the driver for hire the driver. So there's ways of doing things. There's, there's ways of doing things, but you know, you find a bureaucracy which is so embedded. You know, my deputy just told you about time. If you want to put a right turn lane on a corner that doesn't exist, it would take you between 8 and 12 years to do it. You imagine that eight to twelve years. My borough president has broken it down out of four by working with the government. Found a way to do it. 
four years. There's no reason. There's no reason. There's no reason. It takes 12 years. Eight to 12 years. That's if everything's in place. You know, everybody that the moon is here, the Mars is here, it's, it's not snowing in the morning. Everything's going to be in place. That's it. But the, the other way you operate in government is by relationships. Everything's a relationship. Just try to picture this. Put yourself in my place. 2001, January, January, uh, November 6, 2001, you elected Power President. All right? You were elected as an enrolled conservative. Not a Democrat, not a Republican, enrolled conservative. The first time in the history of New York State. You got three other borough presidents, four other borough presidents. One's an ultra liberal, and you got three that are Democrats. Four Democrats, but one is an ultra liberal. Now, you got to get along with them because if you, if you got common sense and you apply it, you say, well, look, you know, we're single. But we have five votes on that committee because we all have an appointment. And I have five votes in that committee. If the five of us can work together as a team, and something is concerning you in the Bronx, and something's concerning you in Brooklyn, something's concerning you in Staten Island, and I'm from Queens, you need my help for that vote, I'll give it to you. So I go in the next morning, I call up my colleagues and congratulate them. I said, you know, I got a crazy idea. So I'm, I'm speaking to, the uh, first part person I'm speaking to is Marty Markowitz from Brooklyn, who I've going into a very, very close relationship with him, socially and otherwise. And I said to him, I said, Marty, I says, why don't we get together? He was up in the Senate, was a friend of him, and I said, why don't we get together? Every so months, you know, each, every three months we go to a different bar, and the bar president springs for lunch, and, you know, we match and match, and when we go to see the mayor, we go together as a unit. He said, it's a good idea. Now it's ten years later. We just did it two weeks ago, we did it. Again. Yeah, but it works. It works. Because, you know, I remember, I remember Carrie on from the Bronx calling me up. There's an, an, an issue in front of uh, EDC on the bonding of the Yankee, New Yankee Stadium. There was a problem. There was an overrun. And he didn't have the votes. They called me up. He said, Jimmy says, I said, you got it. You need the vote? You got it. He says, well, some guys are saying, I said, you got the vote. I said, what do I care? But there was another time I would call Carrie on and say, Carrie on, this is in front of the finance board. I need this vote. You tell me you got it. So it, it works. It works. It works to have that relationship. You know, people say that I have a great relationship with the mayor. I never disagree with him. That's, that's, that's nonsense. That's strictly nonsense. When I disagree with the mayor, I, I do it in a room with the door closed. I disagree. With him. The man's the mayor. You have to show him a certain amount of respect. <laughs> the same way the president is the president. You have to show this respect at the position. Have you can't you can't tear a person down in public and then expect to get a favor from him. You can't. In private, you can do it. But if the man if he's a reasonable person, no matter who he, she is, in private, you've shown him that you're wrong. He's going to say, well, I don't agree with you, but at least you make it a point. So you can't be offended by it. But going to the paper and attacking somebody, you know. And, and, and I don't think it's productive. To me, it's not productive. To me, it's not productive. We did it just this morning with a commissioner that they needed something, you know. And my colleague, without going into details, my colleague blasted him out in a letter, and I was part of the letter, just because I, had, I was pleasing him. And this morning I called him for a favor. He said, you got it. Said, and he called my deputy back in 20 minutes. He said, you got it. You got it. So that, that's what government is. It's give and take. Government is give and take. you got to realize that when you're in an elected office, the people you represent are the same people that the president represents, that the governor represents, the Senate represents and the councilman represents. They're the same people. And you you want the same thing that the councilman wants, the mayor wants. The only difference is, is how do you get there? You know, the, the, the road to success goes by different routes for, for everybody. But you run for election. You put yourself in front of half a million people in Staten Island, and although Staten Island is very small, we look at New York City, we'd be the 35th largest in America if we were a separate political entity. We'd be the 35th largest in America. You go in front of half a million people, and these people say to you, we're going to elect you, right? And we want you to improve our quality of life. We want you to improve our quality of life. And we want, in the morning, to get up and find out a city bus in front of our house, so he can take me to work to pay taxes to pay your salary. 
you do it, because you don't have the time to do it. So now you have an obligation you're taking on. <coughs> you're taking that obligation on, whether you know it or not. So under that obligation, you may have to sit down and discuss something with this man of another political party who has completely diff different views than you do. Completely different views. But it doesn't matter. Because he represents the same people you I represent. And we both want what's in his best interest. Their best interest. So you have to deal with it. Doesn't mean you have to break bread with you have to deal with it. In a nice, congenial way. And that's what government is. That's how you're successful. Otherwise you wouldn't be. I mean, to get elected as a conservative in a bar with a half a million people running against a Democrat and Republican, it takes something. Take something. I mean, you have, you have to be known to the people. The people have to say, well, we can trust this guy, you know? And the first time was the toughest, the second was easy, the third time was, <laughs> was really simple. <laughs> the time. But, but that's what it is. <clears throat> and then there's the obligation. I mean, people say, what are you doing? You can't run again. They can't vote for you again. What the hell are you doing out here? Excuse my, my French every night. What are you doing out here in the community? I said, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I said, these are the people that gave me the opportunity. <coughs> these are the people that gave me the opportunity to be called a president. I owe them. I don't only owe them when I prepare myself to run. I'm all, I owe them for the whole length of my, my term. So if they're asking me to come to their meeting, I'm going to come to their meeting. And I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to see what I can do. But there's an obligation. And the obligation is that I have to pay back. I have to pay them back for having faded me. And that's... What it is, it's, it's not complicated. It's not a complicated, being an elected official is not complicated at all. You know, it, it's, it's employing common sense and, and always remembering that you represent the people that elected you, elected you. And you may not disagree with them. And I do many things that I don't get the majority of people that agree with me. But, you know, there's a crack paper. When that paper mill came here, even the borough president, I was the deputy at that time, said, Jimmy, you're looking for trouble. You're looking for trouble. It's no good. It's no good for the community. It's no good this. And I got a lot of flack in the community. Today, the community loves them. They <coughs> loves them. Now, we have three plants. <coughs> and each day, a thousand pounds of garbage is being generated in the pizza boxes. Yeah, they have to make pizza boxes there, believe it or not. But that's, it, that's so you got to say to yourself, my judgment has got to be that this is in the best interest, and, you know. But you're always going to find some resistance. Very good. Yes, uh, I was just wondering if um, Very good. you thought that we should recommission the North Shore Railroad in order to increase real estate value on the North Shore down Richmond Terrace. Okay. What happened? You know the history of North Shore Railroad? Let me give you some history. <laughs> Being all abandoned it and was selling it. Guy Mullenay was borough president. Susan was a congresswoman in Washington. We called Susan, we asked her to buy it, and she did buy it from uh, ISD Money. She purchased it, and we gave it to the city of New York to preserve the right of way. We were concerned about the right of way. Once you, once you built the house in the middle of the track, you're going to build the railroad no more. And so then we started with studies again. And this, this was another lesson in politics. Another lesson in politics. You first had to prove, you had to prove that there was a need for it. See, there's different steps you take when you do certain things. As Deputy was saying, it takes you years and years. You first have to prove that there's a need for this railroad to be to resume the railroad. Who do you have to prove it? You have to prove it to the people that are going to pay for it. People in Washington. We're not going to give you two and a half, three billion dollars to build something. There's no need, so you got to prove it. So again, I went to the Port Authority, they gave me half a million dollars. We did the study. The study came back. Yes, there was a need. Would have the same ridership as the South Shore Railroad, 15, 18,000 a day. So, okay, we passed that level. Then we need to do another study, an alternate means study, an alternate means study, which means, okay, we're going to put a method of transportation there, but what do we put? Do we put a bus rail, light rail, heavy rail? What do we put there? Should we do a study? That takes about three and a half, four million dollars, that study. So, I proposed to pay for it. Out of my capital money, knowing very well it's going to be rejected. And sure enough, it was back rejected. Capital money can't be used for study because that's operating dollars. So I don't have that from there. But now, where, where do I get $3 million? Three and a half million dollars. So I come up with a scheme. I meet with the, the chairman of the MTA. We have a bunch in the city. I said, 
you going to buy some buses from the now? I says, yeah. I says, I'll tell you what. I says, I'll buy the buses. Because you'll buy it. I says, yeah, I'll buy it. I'll buy four buses. I'll give you $4 million. You do the study for me. He agrees. He agrees. So I give, <laughs> so I give them $4 million. They, do the they did the study. The study was just completed, and I think the, the final... The final designation is going to be made, the termination is going to be made maybe the end of this year. The study was done, so forth. So, and it's going to be a bus rail. It's not going to be light rail or heavy rail because of the cost. What it's going to be, it's going to be a, uh, where the track is, there'll be a road. And the buses will be able to get around, on and mid, mid down, down to the ferry, so forth and so on. But it'll be just, just for buses, no cars. Then later on in the years, if you're able to, and what was in office at that time, you could connect it over the Bayonne Bridge into the light rail in, in, in Jersey. We have a connection to Jersey over the Bayonne Bridge that we couldn't get uh, excuse me, for eight, nine years. The MTA would not do it. They refused it. And then uh, when I petitioned them, I asked them when I became borough president, why are you refusing? They said, but there's a law against dropping off passengers on MTA buses into another borough, in another state. I said, well, show me the law. They couldn't show it because it doesn't exist. So then what I did, I called Senator Schumer, who I endorsed also. And that, that may surprise him, too. Mm -hmm. He was a good friend. He says, don't worry about it, Jim. I'll pass, I'll pass a bill in Washington. He says, just to take care of that. If there is one, he passed it. And so they had to give me the bus. And then uh, on a, uh, I forget what holiday it was, but I know that uh, the College of Staten Island was closed. I rented two buses, I rented, and I gave people free passenger over the Bayonne Bridge to the 38th Street light rail to go into Manhattan. And I sent two of my interns, one on each bus, to see how long it would take. It took them 25 minutes. So I had them sold. I said, you can't do it. That is the heaviest bus line line we have on Staten Island now to the Bayonne Bridge in the morning to the Hudson Burger line. And that's improved because it now goes to 8th Street. Right off the bridge. It doesn't go down to 30 Pro Street anymore. It goes to 8th Street. So that's great. But, but everything takes forever. Forever. Now, even when they decide, they say we're gonna do we're gonna do a bus rail here, now the big kicker comes in. The EIS, the environmental impact statement. And that could take anywhere from five to six years. <laughs> so you're not gonna see anything running on those tracks for the next ten to fifteen years, at least. Okay, we have time for yeah. Courtney. I have a two-part question. Um, first of all, what is the hardest part of your job? And second of all, what is the issue that you hear most from people who live on Okay, the hardest part of my job is learning to understand that criticism is part of the job. And it should be. You have a right to criticize me. Uh, you don't have a right to be fresh. You don't have a right to curse me on the phone. So I'm going to hang up on you. I tell you that. But you have a right to question what I do in letters of or anything else. And in my, in my time, I can tell you, I read every piece of letter, every piece of letter, every letter from somebody else I read. Uh, now, Sunday I was there. I was there from 10 o'clock by myself, and I read every letter. The reason I, I do that is because I'm better equipped than anybody in my office. I've got to route that. See, they route it. They have to get a letter and say, well, we're going to send it to Hubbard, which is a Board of Education matter, and she handles Board of Education. But I can maybe pick up that letter make a phone call, and that's have to go no further. Or maybe it should be not should be routed to us, it should be routed to somebody else. You know? So I like to read it. And also then it gives me the opportunity when I'm outside in the in the public, you know, I meet someone and they say, you know, I say, yeah, I got the letter. I got it. Look, we'll see what we're doing. Then it goes to the health department that responds within forty eight hours. But just just responds to tell them we received your letter, we're working on it, so forth and so on, we'll be back in touch with you. So that's how we work it. So you got, you got to be able to take criticism. I don't care how fine you are. You know what I mean? The, the, the perfect example I always give, I always give, you know, uh, Jesus Christ came down and never preached harm to anybody. And they said, well, suppose I slapped you in the face and you turned the other cheek and they crucified him. So <laughs> no matter what you do, <laughs> what you do in life, there's always somebody that doesn't like what you're doing. So that's the, the biggest problem I have in Staten Island, the biggest complaint. And it keeps, it's ongoing, and we'll keep going on going. It's traffic. Traffic is out of control in Staten Island. Why is that out of control? I'll tell you why it's out of control. Very simply. 
Why is Arlington Phil? 5% of the population of New York City lives on Staten Island, 5%. 18% of all the cars registered in New York City are just on Staten Island. Then after that, that's 268,000 cars. Then we have another 10,000 cars that are registered in North Carolina, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Jersey that live on Staten Island. That's your answer. And the roads were made for, you know, for cows to go out to the fields and eat grass. <laughs> they were made to handle the cars. That's our biggest problem. And like the deputy said, it takes you eight years to widen the street. <laughs> you know, put it down there. I give you, I give you just one example I want to give you about looking at mail. I received a letter. I received a letter, oh, it's got to be beginning of June, and this woman is writing about our neighbor's son to me. And she said, uh, Mr. Borough President, my neighbor's son has brain cancer. He's seven or eight years old, or nine years old. He's just getting ready to go to junior high. And uh, he went back to school, and the kids made fun of him. He had no hair, and they had to transfer him to another school, another elementary school. He said, well, now he's ready to go to junior high, but he's not zoned for the school that he's attending. Because of the, of the school he's attending, that the kids that he, he became very friendly with, he zoned with the other school that he, that he came from. He said that they won't give him a, a variance. So I get the letter, I read the letter. <laughs> this, this is nothing. So I called, uh, I called Diane, who handles boards of education matters, and I handed the letter. I said, take care of this. Huh? Look, she said, oh, she said, that's simple. Oh, because that's easy. He says, we'll get a variance for him. All right. Everything's forgotten. Comes August. She walks in my office. She says, Brother President says, we never got the variance back. I said, why? She said, they refused to do it. I said, I don't believe that. I said, I don't believe it. I said, but the those circumstances, you refused to do it? Yeah. So I picked up the phone and I called City Hall. It was not. It was not. So now I got a letter, a beautiful letter from which I'm going to frame. Beautiful letter from the woman. Now, what an impact you've had on the kid. He's back with his old friends. They all love him. You changed him. He was so depressed, you know, so forth and so on. But this government, this way, I mean, if you went for a variant, your child was at brain cancer. Your child was, why would you say no? <laughs> There's always the exception you have to make, right? right? <laughs> but that, those are, but see, those are the things that make you love your job. You know? Those are the things where you love. You go home that night, you put your head in your pillow, boy, you, you feel like a million dollars. You actually do feel like a million dollars. Being able to do that. Being able to do that. You know what I mean? It's, it's, just, it's just so important. Those are the things that... Uh, it's very rewarding, you know, and uh, the criticism comes with it. Is there anything else? Nobody else? I said, it's an easy class. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say, I have known for many years over a decade that the borough president is really an outstanding public official. What I learned today, he's just as much an outstanding teacher as he is a public official. If you look around the classroom, and, which I frequently do, and look at their faces, you see some kids falling asleep, some, you know, uh, playing around with their um, uh, with uh, an iPhone or cell phone, etc. Uh, no one, no one took their eyes off you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Borough President. And I can say that you are as effective, if not more effective, than any teacher at Wagner College. So I'm not saying that there'll be. I, there might be a job in the I just want to leave you one thing in mind. I just want to leave you one thing in mind. Is that to say, you know, I don't know your background. I don't know your background. I don't know what you, at the end of the day, what you're going to be. I mean, we all want to be a lot, an awful lot of things. I want to be a baseball player all my life. <laughs> I want to be. If someone had said, well, you're going to be the borough president 10 years from now, I said, lock him up. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh -huh. you, know? you never know where life's going to take you. But I tell you, you can be anything you want to be. If you, if you got if you got the will for it, if you got the fire in your belly, you could be anything you want. And the one thing is, don't ever listen to people that say you can't. You can't. I ran for borough president, and he could tell you, because they told me, you can't be borough president, you can't get elected. You shouldn't be. I was told that. I said, who are you to tell me I can't? So if I lose, I lose. You're going to lose. Don't want. Wasting your time. Don't. You want to be something, you feel that you could fit a niche, do it. Do it. Because the opportunities are there. I mean, the opportunities are there. There's this 
a little kid, you know, I go to schools and I speak to these, these little children, especially up with minorities. I'm not ashamed to say it. I go to these kids and I tell them, you know, the cold water flat, you know, chopping wood in the winter to keep warm, so forth and so on, all this and that. I said, it can be done. It can be done. I said, you can be doing it. But you've got to have the will. you got to have the will. And don't listen to the people that say, I ah, can't do it. It's not for you. You don't belong here. It's not for you. You know? You have no idea how fearful I was sitting at the table with Vice President Bush when Guy was the congressman for the first time when I walked in that office. You know, I didn't say a word. I just listened. And about an hour into the conversation, I said, these people are white house. I was comfortable. <laughs> After that, I was comfortable. Very comfortable. But they're the same. They're the same as we are. They're the same as we are. You know? They're the same as we are. They're no brighter. The brain is not made any different. They're the same as we are. Don't, don't, be, don't be frightened by it. Don't be frightened by it. Just take it. <coughs> Maybe they use bigger words. Maybe they make the adjective is after the noun instead of the noun being funny. Maybe that's true. But what does it matter? What does it matter? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's the end result at the end of what you can do. And that's what counts. So that should give you some confidence, I hope. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to use the tape of the presentation in the future. Yes. And we're going to start this Thursday, at least in Dublin 207, discussing the presentation today. You want to take this? Yeah, we're going to